Our modern world is wholly dependent on reliable data, manipulation, retrieval and storage. We use electronic data for telecommunications, finance, security, institutional and military requirements. Key issue is housing and storing this data effectively. Data is used and stored on electronic devices that are enclosed in metal or plastic casings. These electronic devices are concentrated in either servers, network devices or disk storage units. The problem with the concentration of these devices is that they consume energy and as the density of data increases then so does the capacity for equipment to handle this flow. As such, more high powered integrated circuits are used which results in more watts of power consumed and more heat to dissipate. The problem is compounded as technology continues to form some amazing leaps with uh, chip design creating incredibly high density of transistors on slithers of silicon. As the transistors switch to produce that binary pulse, more current is drawn and power flows. So as to keep these chips from melting, more peripheral equipment is added in the form of fans that draw conditioned air over the circuits to remove the heat. Reliable electrical energy is required to serve the needs of the electronic equipment to ensure that the all-important data is dispatched and stored. And effective cooling is required to ensure that electronic components that perform the duty do not destroy themselves. As power goes up in racks, more efficient means of cooling is required to remove this heat so that, they are, that the ever-precious data is safe. Typically it is the servers at the top of the racks that fail, as the heat from all the servers migrates towards the top. Also the cooling systems tend to be from an underfloor unit, placing the top servers further first away from the cooled air. It is therefore the designer's duty to meet the requirements of the client in terms of power and cooling density to ensure that the IT equipment operates effectively. Also, most clients who end up taking a, the data center space have strict requirements in terms of power and cooling. Set points and monitor these either through voltage and current meters, temperature and humidity sensors on the flow and return systems in the chill water circuits, and air flows in the DC space. These tend to be rigorously adhered to as these are fixed within the service level agreements that are signed between the client and the data center provider. We need to establish what the client's requirement for system configuration, i.e. n, n plus 1, 2n, 2n plus 1. Different configurations means different arrangements for mechanical and electrical plant, which can affect the overall efficiency of the design and the way it is operated. It is based on what level of resilience and redundancy either DC provider or end user client views as an appropriate level for their business requirement. So establishing the system configuration early and getting the client to understand the cost of one configuration to another is fairly important before proceeding with the design. The anticipated power density for the DC is crucial and is generally one of the first things that needs to be understood as this sets the precedence for the design. A technical space may have a need for 100 watts a square foot for the IT equipment, however that is only part of the load and more power is actually required for the mechanical and electrical equipment that supports it. The object is to get the IT power to infrastructure ratio as low as possible. That's to say that for every 1 watt used by IT equipment we really want to keep the power for the M&E as low as physically possible. We don't want to draw 1 watt for IT and say 2.5 watts for M&E. This is just inefficient. Blade technology is still very much in the forefront of discussion with clients and these can form heavy load centers. Cool cabinets may need to be considered that it can handle loads of 16 to 20 kilowatts per hour. This needs to be understood as early as possible. The design for the power system sets the precedence for the mechanical cooling calculations. And if the electrical estimate is out by some order of magnitude, then so will be the mechanical system. Single points of failure in a system need to be reviewed. Remember, you know, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. An internal peer review of the system design should be carried out before submission to the contractors or vendors. Remember, it is always easier and less expensive to alter the design at the beginning than it is when it has reached the site. Oversizing main mechanical and electrical plant can occur in the design for a DC, especially if you're carrying out a specific design based on client supplied information. A client, for instance, may provide information on the IT technology based on either a rating per rack or more often the case on the power requirement per square foot. What is usual is the power requirement may well have been put together by the IT department of an organisation. They in turn have either base their figures on very much rule of thumb or in some cases on type of equipment they are most knowledgeable with and then added on a factor. This can and does lead to some gross oversizing requirements. We the designers arbitrarily take these figures at times without questioning if they are correct. At the end of the day we end up with kit that is too big and underutilized. The designers of the MRE equipment needs to question how the loads have been gathered rather than just accept them as they are. Most errors occur from human failings or actions taken by people. When designing the systems, ensure as much of the human element is removed from the operations as possible. Never design part of a system where the load can be dropped off from critical supplies by one simple incorrect act. Not understanding the not so common uh, single points of failure. Great design may occur to the mechanical and electrical infrastructure with dual redundant paths and cycling of pumps and cracks, either manually or automatic, but crucial elements can get overlooked, such as a single fuse in a PLC or a single PLC in a power management system. If doing a review of the design, then the single line diagrams are not the only drawings to check, but it has to go right the way back to the control diagrams as well. We're not quite talking nuclear industry here, but the same philosophy should generally apply. 
energy consumption is still very much a uh, secondary concern when designing the infrastructure that supports the DC. Greater performance against lower efficiency does not make sense, and designers can take some measure of blame for not pushing for greater efficiency during the early stages of design. Alternatively, alternatively can be held accountable for building too much fat into a system to ensure the mechanical and electrical equipment can always support the load no matter what. Taking DCs forward into the future will require more analytical approach whereby the IT equipment becomes part of the living chain of how the systems operate. We may eventually see water cooling rather than air systems becoming incorporated into the technology platforms themselves, which is currently under research with some of the leading IT manufacturers. Water cooled solutions offer a greater levels of efficiency as it is approximately 3,400 times better at transferring heat energy away from the source as opposed to air. A DC is a higher power user, which can be up to 20 megawatts or 30 megawatts in consumption. If you think that for every watt consumed we actually lose around 90% of the energy before it even gets to the point of use, then realistically we have to create 200 megawatts of energy to serve a DC's requirement. For fairly large scale users as a 20 megawatt DC, it actually becomes more favourable to generate the energy on site, especially as we have a fairly constant base load. This would overcome the generation and system losses from the utility company and spare energy could be sold back to the utility to support the grid. The waste heat from the on-site generation plant can also be used, which can be turned into cooling energy by chemical reaction. Therefore, the overall utilisation of energy for the DC improves considerably. Free cooling for DCs is becoming more and more popular, particularly in cool and dry climates, as less latent cooling is required than, say, for an office. We may also see greater use of new and renewable technology. Fuel cells could be used to support critical power supplies rather than the large, bulky and cumbersome batteries that are currently employed. The actual building envelope could also be designed to incorporate photoelectrics built within the facade, particularly where DCs are located in areas of a higher degree days, such as the Middle East, Asia, North America. Overall, I believe the mechanical and electrical systems for the future data centre will involve a greater integration into the overall building design and also with the systems that are designed to support. Intelligent networks will use processing information from the server that could directly correlate back to the electrical and mechanical power systems and will either turn equipment off, bypass it to another source and throttle cooling systems back based on demand rather than set points. The call for energy efficiency coupled with new technologies must ultimately be the driver for the next generation of DCs.